Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for Scholarship Boy Meditations on Family and Race. My name is Teresa Knott. I'm VC's Interim Dean of Libraries and University Librarian. Before we get started, I have a brief announcement. This has been a year of many changes, an incredible number of them. But a, a, a lot of these were necessary long overdue changes in how we look at ourselves and the way we treat each other. VCU Libraries recently assembled an internal anti-racist work group to begin exploring ways in which we as an organization can be more inclusive and equitable. As we strive towards greater inclusion and equity, we are launching a new series of events under the umbrella title of Voices on Race, Identity and Social Justice. Tonight's speakers graciously agreed to wrap this event into the series and serve as the inaugural event. We will be announcing additional events shortly. If you have any recommendations, please let us know after tonight's event. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Larry I. Palmer is the author of Scholarship Boy, Meditations on Family and Race. He holds degrees from Harvard University and Yale Law School. He spent much of his career at Cornell University as a law professor and university administrator. He is the author of two scholarly works, Law, Medicine, and Social Justice, and Endings and Beginnings. Scholarship Boy is the first book for a general audience. I should add that Larry is deeply engaged in the Richmond literary community and has attended many of our VC Libraries events. We are pleased to host him tonight. Joining Larry is Jeffrey Blunt. Jeffrey is an Emmy Award winning television director whose 34 year career at NBC News included a decade of directing such shows, excuse me, such shows as Meet the Press, The Today Show and The Chris Matthews Show. He is a commentator on issues of race and social justice. He is also a novelist. His most recent book is The Emancipation of Evan Walls, which received very high praise. We, all, we were honored to feature Jeffrey in The Emancipation of Evan Walls in an event last September at about this time. During tonight's events, if you have questions, please use the chat or question and answer feature to share them with us. After the conversation between Larry and Jeffrey, we'll shift to audience questions. Gregory Kimbrell will be in the background monitoring chat throughout the event. And if you have any technical difficulties, please let him know. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to our speakers. Welcome, Larry and Jeffrey. Thank you, Teresa. Thank, thank you. It's so nice to be here, um, to be doing this for my alma mater, my, my VCU, which I'm so proud of and so proud to be uh, a member of the community. It's always nice to participate, um, and particularly with uh, the wonderful folks at the library there. Um, I want to just, just say, first of all, Larry, that this is a really wonderful book. And it is a wonderful story. And on top of that, it's written beautifully. Um, and I just think it's given where we are today, um, reflections on your life in terms of race and, and culture um, and family, um, it really is kind of a gift to the world. And I'm looking forward to uh, exploring that with you tonight. The first thing I want to talk to you about is this goes all the way back to VCU, by the way, and to in a literature class talking about memoir and the idea of how and why it exists. And so the question for you is, when you decided that you were going to write this, what made you think that it was worthy that um, other people would want to read it um, and could use it in their lives? Well, um, that's, a, that's a very tough question, other than I needed to write it. But <laughs> um, I think there were several uh, things that drove me uh, to do it. Um, in my late 30s, I began to remember things uh, that I thought I had forgotten. So I, my memory starts working and I start doing a lot of journaling. And I was encouraged, I was talking to some friends and that actually talked to some folks that there's, there's a story there. And the story is, is 
boy, unusual family in its size for today. Um, and how a person develops and grows up in that family. And I thought that might interest people. As my son once said to me, everyone's been 14 years old and trying to fit into the world and fit into one's family. So I thought that would be interesting. I also thought that um, I, the whole civil rights movement is a background, but I lived on sort of the other side of most people have never seen the, pe the people, some of the beneficiaries of other people knocking down doors and being the next to the youngest in this large family, which started to help us see how race plays into it. But I think the larger narrative that I thought was important is that James Baldwin, who, you know, I was in college in 1962, 63, when the fire next time came out and you know, saw him speak and actually met him a couple of times. I thought that he had analyzed what the problem was, is that whites have difficulty seeing blacks or Negroes at the time I'm to be writing about uh, as anything other than a victim or threat. The human part of, of uh, living in our society at the time I'm talking about was sort of lost. And I thought, I think I can bring these human beings to life once I, once I really start thinking about it. Um, so that was the main thing. And I guess, I think the book has a lot more uh, humility than hu um, an attempt to humiliate anyone. It's really just trying to say, here are folks struggling, here's these parents, here are these kids. They're part of the great migration, uh, Northwood out of central Arkansas. And I thought, a, a boy getting on a train, as, as someone said, that's a story. A, a young boy, particularly as small as I was, I was four foot 11, weighed less than 100 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so what you, you bring me right around to the next question. Um, and if that question was hard, by the way, you answered it beautifully. The, the title, when I, when I saw the title Scholarship Boy, it brought back, I mean, it didn't bring back, but it brought to me so many conversations about race. My daughter wrote a, a piece for Salon a long time ago about um, her going to Princeton. And when she got on campus, people assumed that she was scholarship because she was black. Yeah. And, and therefore, um, other things were attempted to be attached to her. So as you go out into the world um, and you are that scholarship boy, when you titled this, what were you trying to say to us? Well, I, I, I was trying to say lots of things. Um, some people object to the word boy, you know, black boy, native son, that's a pejorative notion. But I think since the transfer, the, the big event that really transformed my life was leaving my family and going to Exeter and adopting that identity of a scholarship boy. And it doesn't mean what it might have meant at Princeton. I mean, Exeter uh, has had quote, scholarship boys since its founding in 1781. And I so knew it enough. You didn't have to do with your color then. If you just came, yeah. you were a scholarship boy. No, no, no. I think about 25 to 30 percent of the kids were on some form of scholarship. Okay. So um, it wasn't, um, I mean, I think there were four, there were three other black kids in my class and one other who joined uh, our sophomore year, who happened to be from Richmond. I can talk about that a little later sometimes. But I think all of us were on scholarship. George Sneed was from St. Louis. His father was a dentist. I don't know if he was on, I was on full scholarship. Uh, and there was one kid um, whose parents owned some of the black newspaper. I don't think he was on scholarship. And Bill Covington was on scholarship. So some of the kids are, quote, not on scholarships, but the scholarship boys were recruited, black and white. They wanted to make sure, as the, the director said once, we were looking for boys who are short on cash but long on brains. So I felt, quote, kind of special because I was recruited and also uh, because of the gifted and talented program. And I tested out of the first year of math. So I was in, I actually did advanced placement calculus at Exeter. So 
all the usual pejorative things would, would be would not be associated with that. And, um, but that's, well, that that's great. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, but you start off the book in the preface by um, sharing a story about um, a, a moment in Boston's Logan Airport. Yes. And how you were greeted by the police there, yeah. which to me, when um, and you can tell folks when this actually happened in terms of the date, but there was little, I mean, nothing in your book could speak more to where we are today than that incident. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that when I wrote the preface, um, I wanted to say to the reader, look, I'm black or I'm Negro, or whatever. But I'm going to tell you a story and let's not, we don't, we're not hiding from that. And that's a classical case of racial profiling. And I believe I, this is, I've never done a study, but anecdotally, I think every black male I know as a contemporary, regardless of what their positions, federal judge, you name it, Goldman Sachs has been at least stopped by a cop once in a situation like that. And what is misidentification? But um, what I didn't, what, what, and I thought also that, that, that capsulized why I'm so, that's my wife, so she's just not an angry person, how I can be very calm in a very stressful situation. And I think that's part of the way I was raised and part of being what I call the post Emmett Till generation. You didn't have to tell me a white, a nervous, federal officer who's armed for the first time probably in his recent career because nixon had just armed these people for the hijacking you don't mess with that guy you just you it's like it's like having a a mad dog in front of you you don't run away because flight right. you're confused um the one thing i in the present circumstance i wish i could have left in what would happen to me? Yes, I'm very calm, I'm cool, I'm able to go back, I read the papers for an hour on the plane and so forth. But what is the effect of being traumatized, which I really was, I, I got through it fine. But this part I took out of the, this preface, but it's in another little piece on my website called, called Call Me By My Name. So I get home, I get to Philadelphia airport, my wife picks me up, Marion picks me up, uh, and I, I'm driving home and we live out in, Jersey, South Jersey. So we have to take 295. We cross the bridge and take 295. And once I start retelling that story, I get so distracted that we miss our exit. We go 20 miles past our exit. We almost go to Trenton before. Wow. And I said to myself, suppressed anger can kill you. I mean, 295 wasn't as crowded in 1970 as it is today. Well, but, that was, but that was so um, uh, traumatic. And um, it relates to a lot of the issues in criminal justice today. Uh, I think the big issue is misidentification. And the second piece I wrote, for, it's in VCU, and it's also in the Press Train Outlook, called Call Me By My Name, starts off with that trial. Okay, well, it, it, it's really interesting to hear you talk about the traumatic part, because actually in the, in the book, you think you got over it. You say you put it in your back, in the back of your mind, and you yeah, yeah. Food, but then when you got home, you didn't. So that, um, so is there, is there a lesson from this story for young people today who are not from the post uh, Emmett Till generation? Well, there is a lesson. I guess it's more fear on my part. There is a lesson. Um, I think at one level, the protests are very important because it gives you some uh, means of getting some of that anger out in a more passionate way. I always say the best thing to do when something makes you angry is turn that anger into a passion. But I think there ought to be a little bit of warning because many of us might be taught, you, you know, you can't, you, can't, you can't show what you're really feeling, you know, you know, I, I was tempted, for instance, to want to argue with the cop whether or not I looked like the guy he claimed the picture looked like. It. But um, I'm a little afraid that at some point someone might lose their cool, like I lost my cool driving home, and do something that's very dangerous. I mean, it's violence has always been part of race in this country, and 
you've got to have some strategy or some way of dealing with it and not getting pulled into it. So, that's, a great, that's, that's a great answer. It leads me perfectly into the strategy you would have and your family would have. So you're, you're the ninth child of 10. Yes. You're growing up in St. Louis. Talk to us about what it's like in St. Louis in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, you're coming of age. Um, you are, as you refer to in the book, as, as we were referred to in the time as, as a, a Negro boy. Um, and the world is in front of you. Um, it's a big family, chaotic things are happening. Um, talk, to, talk to us about, I want to set, up, set everybody up for the moment when you go off to school, but tell us what it was like to get you to that point. Well, there's several things, um, to just sort of the big, the, sort of the big vector, uh, vectors in my life at that time. So my parents have left Arkansas March of 1944, and I'm born in June. I'm born at home down on the north side of downtown on Dixon Avenue. We move out to Maple Avenue in the, in three years later. Uh, the family myth, and it looked like it happened, is the educational opportunities in Arkansas were so limited that my oldest brother, Al, had was sent away to a small boarding school um, in central Arkansas. Um, that, there was just no educational opportunities. And my father lost his job with the uh, Farm Security Administration after being a teacher. So they were looking for educational opportunities. And it, that's the way I, I call, I lived, St. Louis compared to Central Arkansas had checkered board segregation. It wasn't totally segregated. There were openings and things and it looked like my parents kind of set it up for us to take advantage of openings. And, you know, which movie theaters could you go to? This one, but not that one, but maybe the ones downtown would have special show. If Lena Harm was st starring in the show, they would <laughs> have a special matinee on Saturday morning yeah. or something. Um, but St. Louis, I believe, was in effect planning for Brown before it happened for various reasons, uh, how the city was with a lot of car manufacturing, meatpacking plants, lots of working class, middle class blacks in the city. But um, so in 1953, the year before Brown, the people next door to us, the little boy next door in the apartment building was white, the kids on the other side of us were black. He went to one school one way, we went the other way, but these other black kids went to Catholic school because all the Catholic schools were integrated. So, and, and I just remember this this morning, I had a cousin who was blind, but she was at the Missouri School for the Blind. And I once went to her Christmas party, but those were integrated since they couldn't see each other. It's just ridiculous. Oh, wow, how about that? <laughs> so, wow. Um, Things were sort of opening up in, 50, in the 50s and 52, Washington University, it's a private university, voluntarily desegregated. St. Louis School of Pharmacy, where my brother Mac wanted to go, desegregated. There was even a boarding school, private school in the county, Thomas Jefferson, which desegregated. So come 1954, the high schools desegregated. In 55, this was already planned, the elementary schools, and that's when in 55, I get to go to this gifted and talented uh, program. Where you find a mentor who, oh, yeah. lead, who leads you towards excellence. Excellent. Yeah, and my mentor, for instance, had gone to Stowe Teachers College where my brother Willie, my brother Willie was in college when I was in kindergarten, okay? So that started a pattern, <laughs> of, uh, but it's all free public education, basically a very minimal cost. Um, because the school board actually ran the teacher's college, the black and the white teacher's college, but uh, they merged the teacher's college and all these things were happening because they were planned for three or four years. They were anticipating uh, Brown. So, and there have been other things were being desegregated by sit-ins and boycotts downtown. I used to say, when I was a kid, I thought if you went shopping downtown, you got to eat lunch out. Now, why were my parents doing that? Well, the restaurants in our neighborhood, like the Howard Johnson's, would not serve black, but 
there had been enough pressure on the uh, lunch counters downtown, particularly in the big department stores, that they not only would serve blacks, they started having to hire blacks. So lots of things were opening up uh, in St. Louis. Of course, they didn't last necessarily, but I think of, you know, I, the restaurants in our neighborhood open up, I get a job at a car hop. Uh, they start hiring blacks as ushers at Municipal Opera one summer while I was extra, I work there. So I always feel somewhat guilty about this, but people are opening doors and I just sort of walk through. And part of that is because particularly my mother was very active in all community affairs knew the teachers, knew the people in the core who were running this, and some of my older brothers and sisters were involved. So um, I did not, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry, so it's very interesting that you, obviously your parents were into education, they, they moved there to give you guys more opportunity. Yeah. In, a, in a beautiful part of the book, Dancing With My Sister, your sister um, decides that she's the first one to find out that you can read, Yeah. <laughs> this becomes a big thing. And then um, another thing is you go off to school for the first time and a sibling drops you off, not your parents, yeah, yeah, yeah. but your parents are into your education. But then when it's time to come to go to Exeter, your dad isn't really sure about this. And your brother Al is Al, right? Who steps in and, and grills the Exeter representative about how it's going to be for you. Yeah. Yes. Um... Remember also, both my parents were college educated, which made a big difference. And right. they were into it. My father, I didn't know what his objection was. My mother could, my mother could see, once she looked at Exeter's profile, she could see a path to the Ivy League. My dad's <laughs> looking more, I think, more, here's my little boy. Uh, he's smart, but do I really trust these white men to take care of him a thousand miles away? But it was my older brother who, not just the representative, the principal of the school came out and visited with my parents and uh, wanted to visit my parents. My dad didn't want to take off from work, but Al did. And he was very gracious and explaining why dad wasn't there. But he really had a real frank conversation. You know, is he going to be the only minority there? He says, we hope not. We are recruiting. You know, we have a person whose job it is to go find scholarship boys. How do we find Larry? Well, we built the relationship with the Urban League here who knew Dr. Harm, and we're building a network trying to find these kids. And um, so it turned out to be four kids. One other kid from the Gifted and Talented program went, George. But George and I really weren't friends before we got to Exeter, so that was not there. But there is a little Richmond story that's connected to this. Okay. St. Louis story. So, and um, Arthur Ashe and three other boys on the north side all decide to take advantage, they're closing the schools, they take advantage of the state scholarship programs to go elsewhere. One of whom from Richmond joined our class sophomore year. Another one went to a private school in Connecticut called Hotchkiss, who I later met in 1963 when I was working for a civil rights organization in Boston. And Arthur Ashe went to Charles Sumner High School in St. Louis. Because, because the schools were desegregated and St. Louis was a big tennis center at the time, he would have the competition he would not have here. And right. Charles Sumner High School is where Leela and my older siblings went, but Harold transferred to Soda in high school in 54. So it's interesting that Virginia made my class at Exeter a little bit more diverse. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we had five kids graduate rather than four. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good yeah. story. Yeah, but Charles Sumner High School was probably the, it was the first high school for blacks west of Mississippi. It's more like, you know, the Dunbar High School was in Washington, D.C. Right. And if there were people from the Ivy League, I mean, like, there were people from who had gone to Harvard who taught there, who lived around the corner. Right. One of the first people with PhD from Yale was black, taught there. So it was like Ash's coach knew this network. I feel like it's this very narrow network that if you weren't on, that this is where you know he can be taken care of and there's support in the community and he can play tennis. And he won the national junior championship, indoor clay championships, 1960, as soon as he moved to St. Louis. So so you get on a train by yourself. Right. So your so your 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 sibling drops you off in the early days. 
you get on the train by yourself, and this is understood because we're talking money, the train, the airplane, and everything else to, to, to go to, to school. Um, and one of the first things that happened to you is a, a white administrator says, you need to cut your hair. Yeah. And, um, and, then, and then within the same chapter, you talk about sitting at the table, I think it was in, at, at a dinner table, and the boys are chatting back and forth, and another boy, um, both of whom are white, one calls the other the N-word in front of you. And, yeah. and, and you confront him. Um, and it's interesting in the way you confronted him because that young man became one of your closest friends there. Yeah. My question is, you get there, change your hair, you hear the N-word, how do you then settle yourself so that you can do the things that you did, uh, that you can be successful there? That, that's a good question. I, I, I just finished reading David Copperfield. And, it, it, you know, one of the things about David Copperfield, at some point when he's being so abused, he can't learn. Right. Oh, okay. So I think here's what I, I, I try to do, even on the haircut. Remember, I've never been to a barbershop, period. My dad cut my hair. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not only that he's telling me to go to a white barber, he's telling me to go to a... And, I'm, you know, you, you've got to have a double consciousness, as Dubois says. I see those signs in Exeter, New Hampshire. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. In St. Louis, that means no blacks are served. And I'm, I'm sort of, I'm noticing my hair is getting out of shape. Is I'm trying to look for this. And I have gone, I, one day I see a black airman. Pease Air Force Base is 15 miles away. And I walk up to him. He's all dressed up. And I said, where's the barbershop? He says, there are no there's none in Exeter, there's one at T's Air Force Base. So here's how I think I about it. If you go back the way I remember it, what the teacher, Bedford, is doing is basically saying, your parents, he's connecting to the values of my parents, your parents would not want you to visit this New England home in Salem, Mass, looking the way you look. Right. The second thing he does is he basically says, when he, he orders me, I complain that he won't know how to do it. And so he says, you're going to teach him how to cut your hair. What he's basically saying is, the barber cannot refuse you, the academy barber. So you and your Negro hair belongs here. So I took that as a sign of support rather than a, a, a sort of cultural assault. And, and he was sort of bald and he was young, very smart. I mean, he's brilliant guy. So he, so he was jealous too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <it's> like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm sort of fiddling with my tie thing. <laughs> this guy doesn't have any hair. But he's yeah. like 20, he's, uh, he's 10 years <laughs> older. So he's 10 years out of Exeter. So he's maybe 28, 29 years old. But um, so, that I actually pull support from that, and I'm going to come back at the end to tell you what happened later on in Exodus history about blacks and their hair. But the the context of Brink, my friend Brink, using the N word to denigrate another white boy, was something I just had a lot of um, emotional and social capital. Because my older sister, my dancing Leela, had told me, don't right. forget your, your feelings. But she's basically saying, you're leaving home, you're going to get hurt. And yeah. You're going to have to deal with it. Right. And I guess I had, to, in my mind, I had to live with these people and I had to set the boundaries. And Brink's father had gone to Exeter. Uh, there were a number of Southern kids at Exeter from Alabama, Little Rock, the chairman of the Little Rock School Board, with, their kids were there. But Exeter, I, I knew, and I had this conversation in my head, this tape in my head of my brother in Saltonstall. I knew if I complained about it, he might have to go home. Right. But if I didn't get the boundaries I want, I was going to have to go home. But by, by today, pushing, go ahead. I'm sorry, today, that would seem awfully gracious. Um, but I think there's a huge lesson in that, in that you, because... Um, when we talk about learning each other's stories, absorbing yeah. each other's stories, and realizing who we are as people and being able to cross the barrier, you were able to do that with because Brink became one of your best friends. Right. Yeah. And, and that would, would not have happened had you reacted a different way. So you managed that 
you managed it with the administrator who wanted to cut your cut your hair because he then became a mentor. Yeah. So, so talk to us about how you managed Exeter in a way to come through that as a a a, uh, a black boy in those times um, without the scars that many of us might think you have. I mean, I'm sure you didn't come through scar free, but um, you know, as, as I read the book, it seemed to me that while you had some incidences, um, for the most part, things were comfortable. I mean, even one time just shocked me. So you had a situation where the girls were coming from another school to dance yeah, and they were going to be all white. And you were more worried about your height that you were short than you were worried about the fact that you were black. Yeah. And I thought that is a whole different, that's, that's a different, um, feeling that I thought you might have had. Can you speak to that? Well, I, I think I was also more aware of the social economic differences. I don't think those schools had broad scholarship programs. So these are mainly, it's not that they're just white, they're mainly rich kids. At Exeter, yeah. the other scholarship kids, their parents were school teachers. And one of the kids in my, class, in, in my dorm sitting at that table, uh, Jonathan, his father worked at the Sylvania factory. Uh, so. I, I'm thinking, and when I was in the gifted and uh, talented program, there was only one white girl, a one white student, and she was a good friend of mine. So I hadn't, I had socialized and played with whites even as a, before I got to Exeter. Right. Yeah. But I just, I think, um, for various reasons, which I think come out in that chapter about my brother Al. I was, I'm a late bloomer when it comes to girls. I was small, I was late coming into puberty. You know, I drew enormously once I start growing. But um, I, I, I think, I, Brink and I are friends, but I had a lot of capacity for deeper and deeper relationships over time. And I didn't necessarily just, you know, Brink is my only friend. I had lots of friends. Right. But he and I were the same, almost the same size. We were on the wrestling team together. Uh, I would help him out. Like he had trouble making weight. I would go out and run two and a half miles with him just to keep him, you know, especially our senior year when I was captain. And uh, it, it was a good relationship for me. And I needed sort of, he was sort of my little brother. I mean, he, he replaced Barry in my life, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my, my younger brother. Yeah. Uh, but I... My brother Al, at some point after I didn't win the Rhodes Scholarship, asked me, do you think you'd lost this because of race? And I said, oh, no, no, no. He says, never think that. But what, what he wanted me to see, let's look objectively. I could see why those people were chosen. There may have been racial factors, but I'm not going to waste my time becoming the victim for these people. I'm going to do the best I can and try to be honest. There are things I wish I'd done differently, uh, but you know, that's amazing. My bro this is a brother who was in Al. Remember, is in a segregated navy, right? In the Second World War, and I once, you know, when I'm in college, I'm in my pseudo radical stage. I ask him, "How did you endure the segregated navy? You're on the U.S. Hancock Sea of Japan, getting ready for this attack, alleged attack." on Japan, no one knew we had the atomic bomb. I said, how did you endure that? He, he's a, a bus boy, that's all he can be. I mean, the Japanese kamikaze pilots and everything flying around. And he says to me, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, he says, I learned to love the sea. Uh, yeah, that's really nice. See, I think segregation wants to basically to get the soul of the black person the, or the black man and control it. And what he basically did is, I'm not going to let your bigotry control what I'm doing. The sea is beautiful. Larry, if, not, if you say nothing else tonight, that was beautifully said, and the message there is so, so powerful. So yeah. thank you for that. I want to let everybody know that it, this is a time to ask questions. You can use the, the Q&A um, feature at the bottom. Um, I am seeing some chat. I'm going to continue to ask questions, um, and we'll just, we'll just – um, bring yours in um i did i do have one already um 
if you were to rewrite and this this memoir, by the way, it, it's it's not told in a linear fashion. It's 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 stories about different family members that take you take Larry's life places. And if you were to re rewrite a section of this memoir now in light of current events in Richmond, what might you alter, delete, or add? Well, I think I would alter that preface a little bit or add to that preface part of the story about racial misidentification. Mm -hmm. Because I think, although I show parts where I'm angry, like at my brother Barry when I try to injure him, right. I, think, I think that story today would resonate with people who realize, A, how dangerous it is when blacks, particularly black men or even blacks are stopped, but also to see what it does to you when you know I don't look anything like this guy. Is right. he stopping every black person in the airport, every black male in the airport, which I've known of instances where that happened in upstate New York at, at uh, the State University of Oleana once. They, they, someone claimed they were raped. They went and interviewed all the black <laughs> males on the campus, weren't that many. It's about, I would add that. That happened to me. Yeah, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I would have put that in there yeah. Somehow, I could have done it maybe surgically in the first couple of pages and just say, I realized how dangerous suppressing anger is. Yeah. So I would, I would try to get my readers to think, this is why some of these kids have to go out and protest. This, but, but I hope they realize from the earlier instance that if anger controls you, you're going to lose, you may do something that's right. stupid. Um, no, that's that. That's well said. Um, another question is, uh, which sections of the book were the most challenging to write, um, and why? And I suspect the section about Brother Urschel might be one of them. Brother Urschel, who had been shot, and who had some by the police before, um, and who had sort of left the family. So you can answer that one. Well. Um... <laughs> I don't think Urschel was as tough to write from an emotional and spiritual level because I accept what happened. And I also have the, the notion uh, that I, I once talked to a clinical psychologist who's also a writer. Kids who run away, remember Urschel runs away. Right. Don't run away. They're, they're, they're probably being pushed out. They don't understand why they are being pushed out. But so... I had some identification with Ursha that I needed to be at least have some distance from this very tight knit, you know, family. So I, if you look at it from the sort of success, I first titled that piece before, when it was in Blackbird, our, our lost black sheep. But then I thought he's a black sheep because he's being stigmatized for getting in trouble and running away. Right. But there's something there I don't understand. I think the hardest part to write was the third part because the, the, the memoir helps build my relation, build who I become out of my relationship to my siblings, but it takes a sort of reimagination of my father for me to really start growing up. And That's that was a very sad experience. I mean, sometimes it would put me in tears. I just couldn't, you know, you, what you miss and so forth. But I think writing that section and actually reading part of Dad's Cane at a workshop in 2014 at Kenyon helped me to, to, to give the grief over and move into mourning. I guess there's a difference that slow grief and slow motion leads to sort of lifelong mourning and appreciation for the life that my dad lived and for the life that my dad tried to give me. Right, and how it, and maybe how it shaped him, and, and along the way, you can see now why he reacted to you the way oh, yeah, in certain yeah. instances. Yeah, I also have three sons, and I remember how I felt about the idea of their going away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, we have another question. Um, Larry, I know you're an avid reader and have attended many poetry events in particular. How has your appreciation of creative writing affected how you approach writing nonfiction, such as your memoir? Good question. It's a very good question. Um, um, one thing I did when I was really writing the many, many drafts, um, 
I read a poem every morning before I started writing. I picked this up from the 2013 uh, workshop in, at Kenyon, the first time I went with Rebecca McCullohan. She would write, she's a poet, essayist, memoirs. She's got a new book, she's wonderful. But what she would do at the beginning of the workshop in the morning at 8.30, she would recite a poem from memory, which got us somewhat into the language of the rhythm of language as we did the participation readings and other stuff. But it also, um, I think, um, made me more aware of how to keep the rhythm of language there. So that's one uh, big influence. And I still try to do that. If I'm gonna do any writing, I, I, I read a poem. I, I subscribe to several magazines, the New England Review, I read Blackbird, I read, just, I regularly read poetry when I'm writing. The other thing is that um, I'm a big novel reader. Like when I'm doing all this stuff, I'm, you know, I just read David Copperfield, I'm rereading Emma for the second time. I've read four or five other novels since this confinement. Uh, and even when I was a scholarly writer, I read a lot of novels. Um, because I think building a narrative is still, even in my scholarly books, the metaphor and narrative are very important. Absolutely. And I, I by the way, um, was, was beside myself in jealousy when I heard you speak about this friend of yours who you called Johnny, who I call John <laughs> Irving. <laughs> I, was, I was like, what is he talking about, Johnny? So, but so you you did you you guys were friends at uh, Exeter. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you and, want me to uh, talk about? Mr. Oh no Irving? no no no! I, everybody know everybody knows who he is. It, was just, <laughs> it just blew me away to hear you talk to him talk to him about talk about him that way. I remember I, I'm in his memoir, The Imaginary Girlfriend. So oh, yeah, he you actually, return it, return the favor. <laughs> well, I, I didn't actually put anything about him in the memoir. The coach. Oh, yeah, but I yeah he 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 does do a blurb for you on the book I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's very so, kind. So you had a lot of life under your belt, as you should when you're writing a memoir, because you want it to be worthy of something. But but the opposite side of that is there is so much to choose from. How did you narrow down? How did you also um, how did you decide what was important? Even as you're telling stories about your family. Which ones, how did you decide which one was important enough to drive the narrative that you wanted us to get to? Well, um, the first thing I did once I decided on the structure in 213 was to actually write what a good development editor suggested to me. Some sibling, I wrote the meditations on my siblings and just wrote until they intersected with what I thought was the main thrust of the Exeter growing up story. So. That was the main thing. And then and in, in that process, I discover if you're looking only at sort of the educational achievement, my brother Willie is a very important figure. So I put Willie and the Exeter narrative together, and then I put sort of dropped each of the sibling narratives into the Willie narrative, and then I started weaving. This took me almost three years to do this, though. Um, and also, I thought the poetry, going back to the poetry, um, I had looked at the memory problems as more archaeology rather than digging up stuff. There's a fragment here of, say, Willie that goes with this fragment over here of Al taking down the tree. And I, I can go through the book. Sometimes, you know, I, I did have cards, different colored index cards with each of their names and all the scenes written down. So eventually I did do kind of a storyboard um, to uh, kind of put it together. But I was looking, the way I put it together was to think, yes, Willie looks at the reader's going to think, oh, he's you know, a photographer. He teaches the kid how to pay attention, blah, blah, blah. And he's always giving him more advice, even on who he should marry. Um, but the emotional river, I think, is built out of some of those other siblings, like my brother, my sister, um, kind of helped me build that emotional river. And 
it does those parts are much more uh, both all the parts are i think have a texture of these are complex relationships these people love each other they hurt each other um uh, and uh but in the end i guess i know they're there and they know i'm there for them which is, which, which is perfect for the the last question i want to ask because i think we're about running out of time um we may have time for one more after that but at if someone asked me why I didn't, one of the questions I get a lot about my, my most recent novel is why you didn't do it as a, a memoir. And of course, when you do that, even people you are close to, you just mentioned the family and the dynamics, you put them out there. It's your story, but they're attached to your story. And then some very vulnerable things about them occur. Um, wow. So how did you tell them, <laughs> I'm going to put you in my book and I'm going to tell this particular story about us? Well, I, I didn't talk to any members of my family. I did not let anyone read it who was in the book yeah. until I finished. And I guess I was trying to hold myself to a standard of integrity that I'm telling the story from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And this is my version of it. And I... I don't put anything out there that I think is their story. I don't try to tell anybody's story other than my own. Right. And, I, and I try to do it in a way like a good novelist. I love these people and I'm going to treat them with human dignity. So I'm not, you know, I'm pissed off at Barry, angry, unable to show it perhaps, but. Right. Uh, um, but they received it well. Oh, better than well. I mean, oh, that's great. That's great. I, mean, I mean, I've had many phone conversations, especially with my brother, Barry, he was just, they've been very supportive of me. And I think, because I think in the end, they all see the attempt to be very honest about that. And I think most of my siblings who are still alive, feel very grateful for being in the family that we were all grow, grew up in. So that's wonderful. Yeah, okay. All right, the last question. Um, Larry, as a national expert on health policy and law, you have examined issues related to bioethics, areas where medicine, law, and policy intersect. How did your education lead you to these interests? Um, <laughs> um, I had the advantage of a very fine liberal education. So, um, let's say you have a requirement to do a natural science requirement at Harvard, okay? You can take natural sciences one, two, three, but you can also satisfy it by taking calculus and chemistry at the same time. I did that. I took the, biology was not a big course at Exeter. We had to do physics and chemistry, but I also took biology. So I've always had a kind of inkling about science. And secondly, um, when I clerked for a federal judge, I could start to see that technology was going to have a great influence on even the way law is practiced, you know. Um, and I like the intersection of institutions, I'm an institutionalist, of science and law in figuring out how they affect the way people relate or don't relate. Um, so that's how I got interested in it. Um, and also, the scholarship boys, I always say, when I refer to myself in the third, but always ends up finding the mentors he needs. People at the Yale Law School that I became close to were big interdisciplinary um, scholars. Joe Goldstein, who I never had in a class, uh, taught criminal law. He taught, had a book on law, psychiatry, and psychoanalysis. Um, uh, Jay Katz was a, a medical physician who was a psychiatrist and also psychoanalyst, had, they had a beautiful book on family law. So I was very attracted to the, the, the sort of intersections of major institutions. And um, I think that's how I ended up having that interest. And I came out of, you know, I came out of law school in 1969 when these things were just bubbling up with the Harvard brain death definition in 1968. And, uh, Yale Law School was sort of a hotbed of that kind of thinking. 
Um, it's so funny. In 1968, 1969, all this was happening for you. You had been in an integrated schools pretty much, um, you know, from early years in uh, St. Louis. And uh, my schools were just integrating that year. I know. How <laughs> so far behind we were. So, so yeah. um, I want to, I, I just want to, again, thank you so much for writing the book. Yeah. Thank you for, for the conversation tonight, which I, I felt like I learned a lot. Um, more than I did even the, from reading the book. But I think it, it, it you know, I, I think I posted on my social media before I even finished reading the book about how important I thought it was, um, not just to where we are today, but just as, as a, um, a piece of African-American um, Americana, if, as, I, as I say it, um, to show again how varied our lives are and how we are, you know, we spread out amongst the, the country and are doing so many different things and have had so many different influences and have arrived at so many different def, uh, destinations. Um, so yours is a great story. Um, I appreciate being able to be a part of, of, of this. Great. But thank you. For, thank you for reading the book and helping to conduct this conversation. I really appreciate it. All right, we'll throw it back to Lisa. Okay. Thank you, Larry and Jeffrey. Really, really appreciate this. This has been an awesome conversation. I also want to thank everyone who attended tonight. As was mentioned in the chat, a recording of the event will be made, be made available on our YouTube channel and shared on social media after we get a chance to caption it. To find out more about VCU Libraries events, please go to go.vcu.edu slash libevents. So go.bcu.edu slash L-I-B-E-V-E-N-T-S. Hope everybody has a great night. Thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.